Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. Back in the 70s, there were great showrooms where you could go to see entertainers of all types. One of our favorite rooms to perform was the stage door at the Winnipeg Inn in Winnipeg, Manitoba. My vocal show group, Tapestry, was fortunate to appear there with one of the most successful comedians in the business. And he's on our show today. Welcome, Pete Barbuti. Hey, thanks, Rick. Pleasure. It's only been 46 years, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, seems like <laughs> yesterday. And you're still doing it. You're still performing, right? Yeah, I am. Not last year, because that was kind of a wasted uh, year, you know, with that pandemic. But, uh, yeah, I've got some dates booked this year. It's uh, it, it's really, you know, you and I have had a couple conversations uh, since all these years, and uh uh, I was very glad to hear that you remembered the days when when uh, you and I appeared together at, at the Winnipeg Inn, and it was uh, it was really great to finally hook up with you, man. We've been trying to find you for for years now, and uh, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about you on YouTube and everything. But uh, thank God I was able to track you down through uh, a guy that used to be president of the musicians union there and he was uh, nice enough to give me your number and uh so it worked out really well i'm really glad to have you with us today that's well, my pleasure the um one of the things i was going to ask you about being in the industry that you're in is that you know you before you were a great entertainer as far as doing comic you know comic work comedian work you were a, a, a tremendous musician. I remember that so much about you. What, where, first of all, where did you get your training, and or were you self-taught? And what what was the transition between being a musician and a comedian? Well, uh, first of all, I was extremely shy as a kid, and then the uh, the neighborhood I grew up in back in Pennsylvania was divided into sections because it was mostly first and second generation immigrants. And uh, my grandfather, who came over from Italy, uh, he bought a big old house. He was a contractor. He bought a big old house and the whole family lived together. And, uh, you know, mo almost everybody in that neighborhood was Italian, but one block away, everybody in the neighborhood was Polish. And then a couple blocks down the street, everybody was Irish. They, you know, people moved into areas they were familiar with and had neighbors they could understand and relate to. And so uh, in, in our neighborhood, when all of the girls reached about 12 or 13, they had to take piano lessons. You know, and if you were Jewish, you got violin lessons. So the and that was a way of of uh, introducing them to the arts because the European influence was still with them. They're first and second generation Americans, and and so everybody got music lessons. Well, I got an accordion when I was about ten, and uh, that sort of gave me a, a reason to be in front of people and and get rid of my shyness and my inhibitions. And so I started on the accordion and. And I would started playing at weddings and bar mitzvahs and uh, parties and things like that. And I got better and better in front of people. And then the first group I joined was a, a group called the Overtones. It was a jazz group. Bebop era was in. And so we we're playing all, you know, the, the top bebop songs. Like, And if the people started to dance, we would change tempo. We didn't, we didn't want to be, you know, liked, sort of, you know. Yeah. It was kind of the the mentality of the day. And then, so uh, they would push me up front and say, you announce the songs. So I'd start by saying, here's a song written by Lenny Tristano, and, you know, here's a song written by Miles Davis, or, you know, here's a song written by uh, by uh, Billy Strayhorn for the Duke Ellington Band. And, and, and so I got bored just saying that. So I would start to add... These little things, and I would I would go off on a tangent and say it's a song written by Billy Strayhorn, and 
uh, May West. They're on a small <laughs> fishing boat, the Cleveland River, and, you know. And and I go into this whole thing, and and I notice the audience would turn around and listen and pay attention, and be amused at the announcement. And then we start playing, and they turn back and they ignore us. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of got the idea very early, and I was lucky to play with very good musicians. Some old guy told me once. He said, uh, when you become the best musician in your group, leave the group and go with a group where you're the worst musician because you'll, you'll end up playing up to the level of everybody else in the group. So anyway, I, I, I had another small group, a trio that we worked around local things back in Pennsylvania. It's called territorial bands. You know, you'd work like within 100 miles or 150 miles of your home. And uh, mostly in the summer when high school was out. And then uh, when I graduated, I put together a, a group called the Millionaires. And we went on the road. We were very successful and worked for, uh, uh, I guess, six, seven years. So the guitar player got drafted. That was the uh, Korean War. Mm -hmm. uh, the other guys were, one guy was out of the, the oldest guy, the drummer, he, who was my best friend for generations. He was already in the Air Force and he was out. And so uh, he couldn't get drafted. And the tenor player was in the Army. He had just gotten out. And I was in the Army Reserve. So I, I was exempt. But the guitar player wasn't. And he got drafted. And so we tried adding another guitar player. It wasn't the same because we did four-way vocals and things like that. And uh, It just it was never the same again. We had little comedy routines we do. And you take one guy out and it destroys the whole uh, concept of the, the unit. And uh, so we had another guitar player join us. He was a good enough musician, but he just didn't fit in. And then I added another guy to the group, a vocalist, and, and then another. And then finally, that group sort of ran its its, its tenure, and, and it just wasn't working out anymore. So a couple of the guys left, and I organized another group with the same name. And we came out to Vegas. And uh, we, it was a very successful group. It was very good musically, and, and we were sort of the hot group in town. But then the drummer had a chance to go with Harry James's band, and so he left. And then uh, the guitar player didn't want to travel anymore, and so I put together a, with one of the owners of the Thunderbird Hotel. His, his name wasn't on the license because he was, you know, mobbed up from the Midwest. Yeah. But he was one. Of, he was one of the owners, and so he said, uh, "Look." You know, he was kind of a fan of mine. So I had to put together a group that you want. So I got, uh, at the time I was also playing trumpet. You know, I was self-taught on trumpet. I just bought a horn in a pawn shop and started practicing on it. Mm -hmm. I knew enough from, you know, my high school teacher taught everything. So uh, I put together, a, it was the same name, The Millionaires, but it was uh, six musicians and a girl singer. And we work in the Thunderbird Lounge, and every entertainer was coming by to see us. We were the hottest thing in town. And we, from there, we went to Reno, and we did an album for Capitol Records. And, and then we went to Lake Tahoe and broke all the records there for attendance. And then the, our manager came to me and said, uh, uh, we got problems. I said, what? He said, well, two or three of the guys aren't satisfied or... And I said, why? And, and and they had bizarre reasons. And so the group broke up, and I was left with uh, uh, four kids and a wife. And I had signed for all of the uniforms and the wardrobe for the girl singer and, uh, you know, all, all of the extra instruments that we needed. It was uh, two trombones, trumpet, a piano, bass, drums, and a girl singer. And uh, anyway, I was absolutely destitute and so i i called uh if you remember the mary Kay trio they used to be oh, big yeah. in vegas great yeah, yeah. Well, frank ross was the non k you know it was mary Kay and her brother norman k and it was frank ross right and frank uh, was a, a fan of mine and a kind of a buddy and and he uh he said you got to go out on your own and i was terrified so he said i'll i'll call an agent so he called a guy and he, i can almost say his name george something or other, in L.A., and he, he, he said, I'll get you booked. So he got me booked in a place in Spokane, Washington, called the Stockyards Inn. No, it will. I assume by its name it was uh, like a steakhouse, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
I said, okay, that's great. And, and I, said, I said to him, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but uh, I don't have a car and uh, I can't afford to buy an airline ticket. I, I can get there on the bus, but it takes like two and a half days. So if you confront me the money for the bus ticket, you know, I'll, I'll do my best and I won't embarrass you. So uh, he said, okay, I'll send it to you. I said, send it special delivery. He says, don't worry, it'll get there. Well, it didn't get there. So I called him again, and he said, look, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I'm booking it through another agent in Spokane, some local guy. Call him. So I called him. His name was John Powell. And I said, John, here's the situation. And John said, well, man, I got, I got your book. They're advertising and everything. And so he sent me the money for an airline ticket. And I still remember to this day I was getting my salary was 200 a week. And the airline ticket was two hundred and twelve dollars. Gosh! So, so before I got there, I was out twelve bucks. Oh man! And anyway, I landed in Spokane, and John picked me up at the airport, and I had long hair and a goatee, and uh, and I was wearing a real hip-looking trench coat and Italian shoes, and John took one look at me, and he almost had a coronary, man, because you know. This was 1962, but it was still like 1938 in Spokane. It was real provincial up there. Yeah. So all the way out to this club, he kept saying, now, this isn't a jazz gig. This isn't a jazz gig. And I said, don't worry, John. We'll be okay. So we, I walked out to this place, and it was raining. It was February. It was cold, icy rain in Spokane. And uh, I, I got out of the car, and I found out it was named the Stockyards Inn because it was right in the middle of the Stockyards. And there, there were planks, and so we walked across the steer guano on these planks. And we got to the club, and the owner was a guy named Rocky Rothrock. And Rocky's father was a millionaire from the old days, mining and, and uh, lumber. And so his son wanted to have a nightclub. So I said, here, here's some money, have a nightclub. So Rocky didn't know anything about the nightclub business. So I went in and take a look at the bar, and it was long and skinny, but it was okay. It was workable. He said, now, what do you need? I said, well, the best thing if I'm going to work alone is a piano bar. Well, he never heard of a piano bar. So I explained it, but my explanation was that of somebody who I assume would get it in the least amount of words. So I said, well, it's like a piano when you put stools around it, and the people can sit and talk to you while you're playing the piano. So well, that's a great idea. So I came in that night to work, and he had an upright piano up against the wall, <laughs> and he had a bar built around the back of me. It was it was like wait a minute you know you know the piano was an antique it just barely played and uh, it, it was it was really depressing man I would actually go in the men's room and tear up over it but I said well I got to do it because I got a family to feed and so then uh, I said Rocky you know it would be a little better if uh, there's no light in that part of the room you know to set it off like as a stage or something so I said okay I got you covered kid. So he, he hung a light bulb, like a cord down from the ceiling, and he got a shade like in a pool room and a 100-watt bulb. I turned the light on, and <laughs> oh, everybody would go, whoa. <laughs> and then the ne next thing I said, my back is to the people. So I said, oh, he says, I didn't know what you were talking about. So and then the next night, here I have the upright piano with this light bulb, and now he, he put a mirror from a vanity on top of the piano on a, on a swivel, and he said, here, I, I give you a dowel. You can move that mirror, and you can see everybody in the room. Oh, gosh. And, I mean, it was just horrible. And then I finally said, can I get a microphone? So he got me one of those little, uh, like, Broderick Crawford Highway Patrol microphones, you know, <laughs> with six inches tall. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it got worse and worse. And then finally, uh, uh, the, the place, I started to pick up an audience, and the place was crowded. I was doing a lot of local stuff just because I had to, you know, I was forced to talk to the audience. And there were some political things going on, and I was, you know, I got into that. And, uh, you know, there was actually a black guy was running for mayor, which was really bizarre for Spokane. So I said, I said I'm going to start a rumor. I said, the mayor is sleeping with a black lady. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the people never put it together. They, you know, it was, it was like so weird. So anyway, Rocky said, well, he said, yeah, Pete's doing good business, but uh, we'd rather sell food than liquor. You know, and, and when he said that, I called John aside and I said, the guy's an idiot. You can't deal with him. There's no money in food, you know, 10% tops. Yeah. Liquor, it's all profit, you know. So 
So he said, I got you booked across town at a place called the Plantation, and I'm going to get you 300 a week. So now, boy, I was in the money, man. So I worked at this place, and and the owner was a guy named Perry Williams. And he said, you work for me, you're going to have a band behind you the way it should be. And I thought, oh, man, I'm back in show business. Now, bear in mind, I just had the guys I had in my band were like all-stars. Mike Wofford on piano, who's one of the top players on the West Coast. The bass player is a guy who worked with every big band in the country. Uh, the, trom- the one trombone player was uh, uh, the head of the music department at North Texas State. You know, and later moved on to North Florida and started his own program. I mean, these were big time players, man. Yeah. And now, and the band there consisted of an organ player. His name was Tony Pasco. He's a great guy, but everything he played sounded like you should roller skate to it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it had that sound. Yeah. And the rest of the band was a drummer, so it was drums and organ. And the drummer was the owner of the club, Perry Williams. Yeah. So I was opening night. I was singing a song to open the show. I think the lady is a tramp or something. I don't know. I was singing a song, and they were behind me, and it was it was sort of pathetic. But what the hell, you know? I'm going straight ahead, and all of a sudden the drums stop, and there's just organ. Out of the corner of my eye, I see my drummer walk down the aisle, and he goes to the front of the club, picks up two menus, says, "Party of two, follow me." He was seating. <laughs> my drummer was seating people in the middle of the show. It was just oh like, God. Uh, anyway, then this guy, John Powell, said, uh, I got you booked in Seattle during the World's Fair. And uh, that was the beginning of what was happening, because it was 62, 1962, and a lot of celebrities were coming to town. And I got, I got one little story I'll tell you about. It was, till this day, it's the longest laugh I've ever gotten in my life. And it may be a record for the longest comedy laugh. I don't know, but... Uh, I'm working in this little club in Seattle, and I had a great trio behind me, three very good players. And I had my trumpet, you know, my setting on the piano. And uh, I'm doing my show, and somebody sent up a note that said, uh, Rafael Mendez is in the audience, you know, the classical trumpet player, mm-hmm. like the greatest player in the world. Rafael Mendez, is, who did all the movie soundtracks and everything, and said, Rafael Mendez is in the audience. And I said, this can't be the trumpet player. What would he be doing here? And he was sitting with a, a guy named uh, Art Rush, who was Roy Rogers' manager. And he said, he yelled out to me, he says, yeah, he, Roy Rogers is appearing out at the Coliseum for the World's Fair, and Rafael Mendez is his orchestra leader. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, I introduced you the greatest trumpet player alive, Mr. Rafael Mendez. And he took a bow, and the audience applauded, and some drunk said, have him sit in. And I chastised the drunk saying, hey, pal, this isn't like, uh, you know, some jazz trumpet player or something. You're talking about a great artist. You don't just ask somebody like that to sit in. And Rafael Mendez say, yeah, I don't mind. And he come up and he picked up my old horn and he turned to the band. He said, give me Tico Tico in A minor. And he proceeded to turn Tico Tico inside out, outside in. And he did a chorus with that circular breathing where you don't take a breath. Oh, yeah. But all double tonguing, you know, tuck, 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 as fast as you can think. Then he ends on a double, it's an A minor, he ended on a double B above high C. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, then he handed me the horn and got off the stage. And I'm standing there with the horn. All I had to do was look at the audience and just stare, and it got funnier <laughs> and funnier. Then I looked at the horn, and I looked back at the audience, and I looked at the band, and it just kept getting funnier and funnier. It's like, what the hell am I going to do now? <laughs> you know. Oh, that's... Anyway, I, th- th- this guy, John Powell, said to me, this agent manager type guy, he says, I got a chance, we got a chance to do a TV special in Spokane. Well, it wasn't a big TV market in Spokane, but it was a TV special. He said, it's a new savings and loan opening up. And the guys who were opening it, they, you know, they liked you when you were working over here, and they want you to do a TV special for the opening, an hour show. And I said, well, what does it pay? He said, it doesn't pay anything, but we'll get a copy of the tape. He said, but you'll have to write the arrangements. You'll have to rehearse the singers. you have to write the sketches, and you'll have to rehearse the band and everything else. And you'll have to help the director because he's never done a variety show like this. So I was working six nights a week in Seattle, and I'd, uh, I'd go home, sleep for a couple hours, and drive out to the airport, fly to Spokane. It was only like you know, an hour and a half because the jets were in by then. 
So I fly fly to Spokane and uh, rehearse over there for like two or three hours and fly back, sleep for an hour, get up, go do the show. And then and I did that like for seven or eight days. And then finally we did this, this special, and it turned out pretty good, actually. And uh, we got finished, and he took it down to the Steve Allen show. And and he showed up there, and he talked to one of the uh, associate producers. He said, my name is John Powell. I'm from Spokane, Washington, and I have this tape with a comic I'd like you to see. Well, the Steve Allen show was the hottest variety show. You know, it was the forerunner of all the talk shows. And he was in uh, Hollywood now, the, the, on that little, uh, right across from the Hollywood Ranch Market, that location, and the shows were brilliant. He had Louis Nye, Don Knotts, Tom Poston, I mean, Bill Dana, they were all regulars on the show, and he had a great band. And, and so uh, they said, no, we're not going to look at the tape. So John went, every single day he went there, and he, he sat or stood in the back of the room, and they start doing jokes about him. They, they didn't know anything about the geography of Washington, so they assumed... Everybody knows it rains a lot in Seattle, so they assume it rains a lot in Spokane. But, well, it, it really doesn't, but that's irrelevant. They didn't know that. So they start calling John Powell the sponge. They said the sponge is here, and they started to make like a comedy character out of him. And then after about two weeks of him being there every day, uh, they said, okay, get rid of him. So they got a guy named Jerry Goldstein, who was just an usher. And they gave Jerry a Westinghouse jacket. That was the company that uh, produced the show. And they gave him horn room glasses, which he didn't wear. And they gave him a cigar, which he didn't smoke. And they said, get rid of this guy. So Jerry went out and he said, my name is Jerry Goldstein. I'm uh, the assistant producer. And he was putting on this whole show. And uh, so he said, uh, we don't have time to do this. About it. And John pleaded with him, hey, just look at 15 minutes. So Jerry said, okay. So he took him up to the booth. And they put the tape on, and Jerry watched 15 minutes. And he went and he got Steve Allen, and he watched 15 minutes. And then they went and got Milt Hoffman, the producer, and the two writers who wrote for Ernie Kovacs and Carol Burnett. And, all. and, and they watched the whole tape and called me the next day and said, you got to come down here and do the show. So that was the first TV show. And then Nat Cole saw me on that, and I went on the road with him for a couple of years. And and one thing leads to another. So Merv Griffin sees you, and then you're doing that show with Mike Douglas, and then uh, the Carson show, of course. Well, you did a, you did a lot of a lot of the TV shows. You mean Alan Thick and you know Steve Allen's Playhouse and Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin. I know, um, and I think you what, did over 15 shows on the Carson show, right? No, it was more than that. It was like uh, almost 60. Wow, kind okay. of shows, yeah. In fact, I went on the last week. It was sort of the regulars, you know. And uh, Burt Reynolds was on, and, and Burt's a good guy. I had worked with him before, and he's just the greatest guy you'd ever meet. You know, he was wonderful. Great sense of humor. And uh, Burt Reynolds was, was on, and somebody said, you guys tied for the most guest appearances on The Tonight Show. You, you need to go on Wikipedia, man, and change that 15 to 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I did a ton of them. Yeah, that is that's terrific. Let me ask you: the first time that you were on there, I know it was kind of a a novelty thing. Whenever whenever Johnny would ask the uh, the performing artist to come over and sit at his desk, how many times did you play before you finally got the invite to go over and sit with him? Well, strangely enough, uh, that's a weird situation. I did it when it was in New York. That's how long ago that goes back. Uh-huh. You know that. Well, you know, 30 years before they moved to L.A. or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I got a chance to do it in New York, and on the show was Mel Torme. Mm-hmm. And Mel was on before me, of course, because he was, he was pretty hot at the time. And, uh, and they told me, you do your sketch and you walk off. You don't go to the panel. I said, that's cool. You know, that's the rules. That's the, that's the rule set up. And so... Uh, Mel Torme uh, did his thing, and then Carson introduced me, and I went out. And I don't remember what I did, but it was something really off the wall. And Carson flipped out. And so he came and got me and took me to the panel. And everybody was saying, oh, my God, he's never done that before. And we had he did like a whole segment with me and then came back, and we started another segment. And, and Carson was telling a story related to something I mentioned. And in the middle of the story, Mel Torme started to laugh just really laugh hard and Carson assumed he was laughing at him 
And Mel Torme didn't mean any disrespect by it, but he said, oh, I'm sorry, John, I can't stop laughing at that thing Pete did. And Carson turned off immediately, immediately. Wow. He, said, he went to a commercial, and from that day on, I was banned from the show for 14 years. My gosh. 14 years, because uh, Peter LaSalle became the producer. Right. Freddie Cordova was just sort of a figurehead. Peter became the producer, and Peter was the producer of the Arthur Godfrey show, which I did many, many times. And, and Peter was like my biggest fan in the world. And Peter would call me every couple of months and say, I mentioned your name to Carson, and he kicked over a chair. He said, you can't do the show. And so I said, hey, don't worry about it, Peter. I'm doing a lot of shows. I'm just doing fine. I'm working all the time. So then when Carson started to take time off, one of the first guys was John Davidson, and John was a real good friend. I had worked a bunch of dates with him. And uh, John called me and said, would you do the show? And I said, I can. I'm banned. So he, he got Peter LaSalle on the line, and Peter said, hey, long as Carson's not here, you can do it. So I did it, and then I started to do the show with all the guests. Whenever Carson wasn't there, I was the first guy they called to do the show. Oh, neat. And then, and then one day they called and said, uh, uh, can you do the show on, on uh, Friday or whatever? And I said, uh, yeah, sure. And, and uh, I said, uh, who's on the show? And I, because uh, if there were a lot of starlets on, I'd do something more musical. And if there were a lot of music acts on, I'd do straight stand-up because you want to balance the show because right. the show looks good, everybody looks good. You know, sure. the show is the thing. So I said, and then I said, who's hosting? He said, Johnny. And I said, uh-oh, I don't do it with Johnny. I'm on the list. And the guy said, geez, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll call you back for a different date. And the guy called back 10 minutes later. He says, I mentioned your name to Carson. And he said, he's glad you're on the show. Oh, wow. So I went there, and I never apologized, and he never apologized. And uh, somehow we, we created between us this bond, because <clears throat> I would go... I would go barge into his makeup room. He had a private makeup room. I would barge in when he's getting his makeup and tell him the latest dirty joke or the latest <laughs> hip joke. Yeah. And he'd laugh like hell. And then on the air, he'd mention that. And, and you know, <laughs> I'd be yelling at him when he tried to introduce me from backstage. And, I remember and that. Laughing and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, he'd, he'd walk out with the Karnak outfit on and I'd, and I'd stop him and say, wait a minute, let me just get a picture of this. I just saw the cover of TV guide show the you're the most powerful man in the business. And you walk out here, and he broke up laughing. <laughs> I mean, we had this thing going where I could interrupt him all the time, and he never never objected. Sometimes, you know, if I was real pushy, we'd go to commercial, and I'd say, yeah, I hope you don't mind. And he said to me one time, you know what? He said, as long as you're scoring, man, as long as you're doing good, it doesn't bother me at all because tomorrow on the train down from Connecticut to New York City, the, all the Wall Street guys would be saying, did you see the Tonight Show last night? They, they, they don't even call it the Tonight Show. They call it the Carson Show. Yeah. Did you see the Carson Show? Johnny had this guy on. The guy was nuts. He had this beard. And he was smoking a cigar. And he said, they won't even remember your name, but they'll, they'll be raving about how good the show was. And since I'm the producer, that means more money for me. So, so you can do anything you want. Yeah, we became very close friends. That's great. You know, uh, by the way, Sharon, my wife, said to say hi to you. We, yeah, say hi right back at it. I will. Uh, she had reminded me of the, of the uh, lunch that we went, went with you at the Winnipeg Inn uh, when we were appearing together up there, and she'll be glad to hear the story that you shared about the Spokane event with the uh, – and then you went into the restroom and cried because she was asking me about that the other day, and I was going to ask you that question anyway, but you had already alluded to it. So uh, yeah. I'm glad you I, share I, that. You know, I have to tell you one story. I just flashed on this while we're talking. Uh, uh, I was doing the Tonight Show, and uh, I had the same deal with Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon hated me. He hated me. I don't know why, but he hated me. And 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 so when I do the show, I would always refer to Ed. It's it's the old biblical. Uh, heap coals of kindness on your enemy, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so, but I do a routine. I'd say the, the guy was flying a twin engine plane, and I'd yell over to Ed, "That's a twin engine, isn't it, Ed?" And and it would really bug him in the beginning. And then he started to come around, and then he became like my biggest fan. And so he came to me. He said, "Look, I have a whole group out here from Lubbock, 
He said, they're friends of mine. I have a fan club down there. There's about 20 of them. And they came in together. They're a group, and they're sitting over here. Would you go out and say hello to them for me because they love you? And I said, sure, Ed. So I went out and said hello. Well, during the show, since they're sitting there, you know, I can relate to I I did some jokes about Lubbock. You know, I yeah. said, well, we have, we have some people from Lubbock here. I said, would you like to hear some jazz? And I went, hey, uh, hey, uh, like an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> and they were laughing and screaming and laughing. And then, I, and then I walked over to the piano and I said, this is a piano. You never saw anything this big. You didn't have John Deere written on it. You know? <laughs> and they were laughing. They had the time of their life because I was, you know, bring them. I brought them into the show, man. They were they, So anyway. Uh, it's about three, four months later, I get a call from a guy who owns a club in Lubbock. He said, I'm interested in booking you for two nights here. Offered me a ton of money, more more than I would have asked for, you know. So I said, well, okay, uh, what's the club like? It's this here, and, well, I need a trio. Yeah, I'll get you a trio, anything you want. I'll, I'll give you a first class there, and we'll have a limo pick you up at the airport. And I thought, wow, this is great, man. I've never been to Lubbock. So a guy picks me up in the limo at the airport, and he's driving me into town and he puts down the divider glass and he turns halfway around and he says to me buddy holly's buried here and i, I wasn't quite sure what the proper response is to that you know yeah. it's like uh, gee that's great or oh i'm so sorry or what so anyway the petition goes back up then about 10 minutes later he says uh somebody's on the phone for you back there on the car phone they want to talk to you about doing an interview for the, for the club tonight. Uh-huh. And I said, you know what? Uh, something I learned a long time ago from Henny Young, but if you haven't sold the tickets already, it's not going to do much good for me to go on the, the TV and, and, you know, it, it's going to, the TV show is going to play an hour before the show. That's not going to make any difference. And then while I was telling the guy this, I'm thinking, gee, I don't want to seem like a prima donna. So I said, what kind of a show is it? He said, it's the six o'clock news. Well, nobody gets on the 6 o'clock news. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sonata doesn't get on the 6 o'clock news. Yeah. I said, the 6 o'clock news, sure. What I don't know is that after I did the Lubbock jokes on the Tonight Show, some little old lady wrote into the newspaper and said there was some smart aleck on TV last night degrading our beautiful city, and I think we should start a campaign, and none of us should ever watch the Tonight Show unless we get an apology or something. And then the next day, some professional guy wrote in and he said is this lady nuts the guy's a comedian he was just doing a joke then another lady wrote in and then somebody wrote a column about it and this had turned into an issue it was like now up to page two on the newspapers and and, and so i'm sitting in the green room and i don't know anything about this and and the standard duo for the anchor people for the news uh, uh, exceptionally looking young blonde and a very very handsome latino male you know, and they said, we'll be right back with our guest and find out why his favorite view of Lubbock is in his rearview mirror. Oh. And I'm thinking, what the hell is all this about? So they really sandbagged me. I got on there and I was tap dancing. So I had to explain this whole thing. And, you know, but here's the, the capper to the whole thing. I go to work that night. There's a line around the block. And then I realized that's why these rock groups trash hotel rooms and, and get bad newspaper reports and, and because it it draws people people go to see the, something that's bizarre or eerie or macabre i don't know what the hell the thing is but it yeah. was fascinating. that reminds me we were playing up in calgary one time and uh in comparing what you were talking about earlier and how you just went to the restroom and cried about it i mean we we played this gig you know we were a show band and we played yeah. this gig uh, in Calgary, oh, in 75, probably, something like that. And uh, and I, I guess all they were used to having in there were rock bands. And, I mean, yeah. you can only get up there and play some kind of wonderful so many times a night, you know, in Proud Mary. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. the next day I called the agent. I said, get us out of here. Th- this is not a fit for us. There was even something in the beginning when we signed in to uh, to get our hotel uh, room 
that they said, now you all don't uh, write on the walls, don't do anything like that. And I'm, and I'm going, <laughs> what in the heck? I mean, what are you guys used to having here? You know, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, back to what you were saying a minute ago about, you know, musicians trashing hotel rooms. I, I guess that a lot of that happened, but. Yeah, uh, you know, the, uh, the late Bill Chase, who is a trumpet player? With great player, Woody Herman's band, and, yeah. and uh, great player, great player. Yeah. Then he went on the road with a band, a rock band, and their first tune was a hit. It was. I remember it. I've got uh, the album. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Chase told me he said uh, we have a gig booked in uh, I forget Minneapolis or somewhere that we're not going to make. I said, how come? He said, uh, well, our publicist and the, our manager said uh, we shouldn't do it. We're, gonna, we're advertising and everything, and we got they have some people who are going to riot and throw some chairs around and everything, and it's all set up. They they purposely didn't make the gig. They never intended to make it, but but they let all the advertising and the posters go up and everything. And so it's uh, my favorite rock and roll. Rick, my favorite rock and roll anecdotal story is the kid who called his father at work and says, "I took my first guitar lesson, Dad. I learned the name of the first three strings." And his dad says, that's wonderful. When I get home from work, you can show me. He said, so I can't show you tonight. I have a gig. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes, what, are your, where it is. what are your best routines ever? Of course, you can't do it now because we, we, we don't have a visual. We're not doing a Zoom call today. Oh, yeah. But your, uh, your fourth chair trumpet player routine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I love that. Every time I see it, I just I just roll. It, it's so well, much that fun. Was, that was... Uh, that was a favorite of the Tonight Show band. Every time I did the show, they'd say, you got to do the four trump. I'd say, yeah. I said, I just did it, man. They loved it. And and, and so, people sort of related to it, even non-musicians, because I, I think when like when you graduate from high school, there's always a song you sing, and there's only like two or three sort of prima donna people from the chorus who get to sing the solo, and everybody else gets to sing, ah, you know, behind them. It's like the harmony part. And I think that's why people can relate to that. You know, like the, yep. the fourth trumpet player is not playing the melody, really, you know. Exactly. That's one of my favorites, too. Well, another one that I like a lot is uh, is a pig with peg leg. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I told that joke on TV, uh, on The Tonight Show, and, uh, man, I had people calling me, because I would be home. We'd tape the show at 5.30, and... and and uh, 5.30 to 6.30, and I'm only like 15 minutes from Burbank, I catch a 7 o'clock flight. I'd be home at 8 o'clock. I'd be in my house at 8.15 here. And the Tonight Show didn't air until, you know, later. But it would air in New York, and I'd start getting calls from New York. And then, and then I'd get calls from Chicago. And then I, for the next, like, two or three months, I'd be walking to an airport, and a guy would come up to me and say, I'm a vice president of U.S. Steel, and I used your pig joke at our meeting last night. And a guy come up to me and say, I'm a Baptist minister. I used your pig joke at services last week. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> it just, and then it, there was a little uh, a mishap with that. About uh, two or three weeks after that, some star of a new TV show or a new movie, a guy who was sort of like a new star, you know, but he was a big star. He went on there and... Uh, he was going to surprise everybody. He said to Johnny, I never tell jokes, but I have this great joke. And he started the joke, and the band started to boo him. And they were, boo! And Carson grabbed him by the arm and said, uh-uh, don't tell that joke. Pete just told it a couple of weeks ago. The guy was embarrassed to tears. Oh, no. Somebody had told him, and then somebody had told that guy. And by the time it got to him, they had forgotten the origin. Oh, no. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, so that could have been was. disastrous. <laughs> oh, man, he was just embarrassed to tears. While you were... Uh out in Burbank, do you remember ever going over to the D Dick Grove Music Workshop there in Studio City? No, but I know him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that, that uh, I was fortunate when our group was out there playing, my last group, we, um, and we were based pretty much just in the Orange County, you know, L.A. area and playing the rooms out there. And, and uh, we had the opportunity of studying over at Dick Grove's. And I, I tell you what, talking about Johnny Carson, I, I, I had a chance to do some uh, training with Ed Shaughnessy and Louis Belson yeah. and Richie Lepore and uh, some of the yeah. really good, good players, man. And, uh, yeah, it was fun. I had to ask you that question, though, because yeah. uh, that's that's L supposed L to be one of the top uh, music conservatories in the country. 
Yeah, it is. Louis Belson is uh, was a special, not only a special drummer. He was so very musical, but he was a great arranger. Oh, and he yeah. was one of the nicest guys. I mean, everybody in the business would, you know, would say uh, Louis Belson is an angel. Oh, I he mean, he was the he spirit. was incredible, man. I I I. I made great friendship with him, stayed in touch through the years. Uh, of course, his wife, Pearl Bailey, amazing, amazing talent singer, you know, just fabulous. And I still get emails from his uh, uh, latest wife, you know, um, uh, Louis's wife. Of course, we yeah. we lost him years ago, but yeah. uh, but I still get uh, stuff from her, you know, from Remo and things like that, that, that she still has the, the rights to and everything. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's it's pretty crazy. Back, it was, yeah. It, go ahead. He was special. Uh, he was he was really really special. I was going to ask you, Pete, when you were working on new routines and everything. How at what point did you know when the routine was really ready to launch? I mean, and 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 in the effort of doing that, did you ever bomb much, or did you always really test it carefully before well, you did? I, it? Yeah, I had a. Yeah, I've worked at a couple of clubs where I bombed, but it was it was not from material. It was it, it was just a bad booking. You shouldn't, you know, like yes. you say, you shouldn't be working opposite this or that. Or, right. You know, I, I worked Atlantic City to Steel Pier for two weeks with Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Nice. You know, and they do all that Motown stuff, and so, and the the place was just filled with kids. You know, and and so they didn't know what was going on. Oh, okay. I mean, I've, yeah, I've worked jobs where you just. You know, it's the wrong audience, and and uh, you just never should have been booked on it. But uh, yeah, I, if if I'm successful on stage, I get to create that character, that impish guy that people will laugh at, and they feel safe laughing at it because he doesn't live in their town. Sure, you know, he's gonna he's gonna leave, and so you you know he's not gonna be any danger. But he's he's a little crazy on stage, you know, like playing the broom or playing the cigar or something like that. I know you uh, you stay in close contact with many of your contemporaries and, and guys from way back. I know on Mondays you go to breakfast with Shecky Green. I, yeah, I, Shecky's special, man. He's 95, and uh, he has a little mobility problem. He uses a walker now because he had a hip replacement. And sure. Didn't turn out as good as he thought it was. But uh, at 95, I'll tell you, Rick, he remembers every single thing. He's telling me stories about these guys that he went to the track with and and jobs that he worked with this guy and that guy. I mean, he knew everybody in the business, man. And, and uh, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned people from Chicago, which was his home, people that I met because I, when I had one of my groups, the Millionaires, we were in residency at a club on the north side of Chicago. And I met all these people. I mentioned the name, and he would know their with their wife's name and their kid's name and where their kids went to school. I mean, at 95, he's just, he, he's, a, he's a miracle, a mental miracle. He really is. You know, you were talking earlier about Mary Kay Trio, and there was a Billy Kay Trio. There was a bunch of really uh, old-time jazz trios that were playing in Las Vegas, and, and another guy that has a memory like an elephant, uh, and, and you know him, uh, Cork Proctor. Yeah, yeah, I talk to Cork every once in a while, Cork. Cork is, uh, you know, when you when you get on the phone with Cork, you better have some time because <laughs> True. Cork is a, a professional talker. Cork, Cork's an interesting guy. You know, uh, yeah. something we're supposed to be doing together here, some benefit, and Cork didn't show up, and somebody yelled out, "Where's Cork?" <laughs> and yeah. I said, "Well, I said last Tuesday somebody stopped him in L.A. and said, how you doing?'" And Cork's still answering. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I mean, he doesn't take offense to it because he knows how he is. He's, yeah, he's a, living down there in Ecuador. Yeah, he is. He, uh, I've talked to him about three or four times lately, and uh, uh, my good friend Don Clo, who you also know, um, uh, turned me on to Cork. I, I didn't know the guy, and uh, but he says, "Oh, you need to talk to Cork. He's quite a quite a uh, storyteller and everything." And so. Uh, he's the he's the other one that I went to to find out how to get hold of you and uh, yeah he's incredibly articulate. Cork's problem is he's he he never learned how to edit. Yeah, so he, you know he goes he goes over here to from point A to point C, and then he and then he just goes on when he should have ended at point C. You know, <laughs> so, but, yeah he's a great guy and he's been a friend for. He used to be a drummer with a group and uh, he didn't do comedy at all. He was a drummer with a group in Reno. Right. 
R- Rudy Ritardi was the vibe player, and I forget the bass player's name, but they had a, a trio that they worked in Harold's Club for years. He was a very good drummer. And then he became a, a comedian right after that, doing stand-up. I, yeah. I've seen some of his stuff on YouTube, and uh, it's pretty funny. The rooms look pretty small, the videos that I was seeing recently, but uh, but uh, they all loved him. You could tell that he had a pretty good fan base, you know. Uh, yeah, well, like I say, Kurt's only problem is he, he just never learned how to edit. You know, he'd get in trouble. With, he'd work a place, and there'd be a casino manager, and he'd start bragging on the guy a little bit, you know. And it's all right to do that you know up to a point to you know and and then you have to you have to get out of it by saying nah, I'm just kidding he's a great guy you know but Cork would be on the guy like every night and he accused him of being a pedophile and you know he'd just go on and on to finally get fired yeah yeah really um he's, yeah he's a good guy he's a, I'm very fond of him who who has been your most influential entertainers that you that you admired as you were were learning your craft pete well growing up the you know the tv influences of course steve allen was was like a god to me because he was a very good musician he was a composer uh i mean he was everything he was the best host he created everything in there so i was very fond of watching him and then of course sid caesar that whole group of guys carl reiner mel brooks how he they're, they're Howie Morris. They're all, you know, special guys. Uh, I liked all of them, but uh, when I was working in Chicago, some, some of the older comics would come in and say, you remind us of Shecky Green. i say, who's Shecky Green? Well, he's in Las Vegas. He's making big money in Las Vegas. I said, geez, I never heard of him. So when I got to Vegas, I saw his name on the marquee, and he's working in a lounge at the, I think the Riviera, or the, no, the Trop, Tropicana. And, uh, and while I was in Chicago, too, these guys were sort of guiding me. They'd come in. I mean, they were very helpful. They'd say, you shouldn't open with this. You know, the group, you should do more comedy. You should do it. So I thought, I'm going to go see this Shecky Green. So I went to see Shecky Green, and Shecky Green did everything wrong. He didn't have an opening. He didn't have a closing. He didn't, he didn't have a middle. He walked onto the stage, and for an hour, for 60 minutes, I laughed so hard I couldn't catch my breath. He did everything wrong. He he would start a story, you know, he'd start like the mailman came the other day and uh, he had these two packages that wouldn't fit in the mailbox. And then and then, and then he from there he'd say, uh, have you ever gotten one of those packages like from a company? There's this company in Louisiana that's, uh, and, and then he'd say, now there's a guy from Louisiana that I met with. I mean, he would have four <laughs> or five stories going at once. <laughs> And you and you said, how the hell is he going to get? And, and then he would end up finishing all five of them. He would, and and it would just be like, like it was a magnificent Broadway show, it was so perfectly written. He was amazing, and and uh, I went to see him more than once, of course. And each I take other people with me because I say you got to see this guy. He was just it was the funniest guy in the world. And you know, people mention other comics, but uh, Shecky Green did it. Uh, seven nights a week for a month, two shows a night, you know, 14 shows a week for a month. And every show was different and every show was hilarious and the people were rolling in the aisles. Then he'd take two or three months off, come back in and do it again. He would do that. I mean, he made a lot of money. They were paying him 100000 a week back in the 60s. Wow. What that is today, man. Oh, man. That's like a million dollars. No kidding. I remember, you know, I, I still remember I... At a '69 Camaro it was twenty eight hundred dollars. Yeah. So I mean, that's the difference. And wouldn't you like to still but, have that? Yeah, actually, I gave it to my son, and my son got into cars. And there you go. They gave it a name and fixed it up, and paid more for the paint job. Paid like six thousand for the paint job. <laughs> to, anyway, you know how that is with cars. Oh yeah. Anyway, Shecky, uh, I never really met him, <laughs> so. I was working with Nat Cole, we were working at Harris, and Shecky was across the street at Harvey's Hotel. Right. And uh, Nat Cole said, uh, hey, he said, after the second show tonight, you want to run over and see Shecky? He's got a late show. I said, geez, I'd love to, Nat. So we go there, we got there about 10 minutes after the show started, which was the best we could do because of the times. And uh, it was just across the street, so that wasn't a problem. So we, 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 the room was packed, 
And so we took a table in the back of the room. Well, Nat King Cole was probably the most recognizable entertainer on the face of the earth for, you know, more than a generation. He was he was just Nat King Cole. He was Nat King Cole. He right. was the best. And so we sat in the back of the room, and then after like 10 minutes, Shecky said, i got to take a break here and introduce one of my favorite people in the world. I was over to see his show yesterday. He's, he's the best. Mr. Nat King Cole, and the an audience applauded and screamed and yelled, and that took a bow. And then he sat down, and Shecky didn't introduce me, and I was crushed. I, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I was just so hurt. And so he went on with his show, and then about 10 minutes later, he said, you know, sitting with Nat is a young comic. And uh, I went over to see him, and if I tell you how much I liked his act and how funny he was, the rest of the night, whenever I tell a joke, you're going to be turning your head to look back at him to see if he's laughing. And that's not going to work out. So Shecky jumps off the stage. He runs through the entire room to the back of the room, grabs me by the scruff of the neck, hauls me up on the stage, puts a chair next to him, and sits me in the chair and does the rest of his act with me <laughs> sitting next to him on the stage. <laughs> I mean, the guy was, you know, so then we became pretty good friends. And then I was working at a little club in L.A., Slate Brothers. It's sort of like a discovery type of place. Different people would introduce you. You know, Rickles would introduce me and and uh, Rosie Clooney and different people. And so Shecky was introducing me for a couple of nights. And uh, he said to me, you should be working uh, uh, Mr. Kelly's in Chicago or Basin Street East in New York. And I said, Shecky. Boy, I would love to, but they're they're way above my pay grade, man. That you you guys work that. I'm still working my way up to that. But uh, thanks for the idea. So anyway, it was several months later. Uh, Arlene Rothberg, who was the uh, agent, the booker for Kelly's, calls me and said, "We'd like to try out as an opening act and see how it works out." And I said, "Fine, I'm thrilled." So I did open for Morgana King. She was very hot. Had a couple of albums. It was just before she did the Godfather film. And so uh, I, I worked as an opening act for her, and it went pretty well. And so then uh, in the future, they booked me in as a headlining act, and I worked it twice a year for uh, maybe 10 years. And uh, then the same thing happened in Basin Street. They called me and got me booked, and she put in a word for me from Mr. Kelly's. And I started working there, worked with the Buddy Rich's band, I worked with Carmen McRae, and, you know, I worked with all the big stars there. And, and uh, Arlene Rothberg told me, like, uh, after about five years when I was working there, she said, you know, and Shecky called. He said, Arlene, I want you to book this guy, and if he doesn't do business, you don't like him, I'll pay him. Huh. So I thought, boy, that's uh, that's what you call a, you know, a mentor, and that's what you call a benefactor. No kidding, man. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's the dearest man you'd ever want to meet, and he's kind and gentle and in fact, I, I did an interview show with Shecky and John Biner, who's another oh, one of my favorites good, and good friends. Good one. And 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 uh, this guy Randy Credico has a show in the arts, so we were doing the show, and Randy said uh, he met Shecky in Vegas. He, Randy was a comic too, and uh, but Shecky didn't. Uh, Shecky had never seen him, and so Randy was sitting in in a, in a restaurant, and Shecky sat down next to him. And and they were having a conversation, and Randy said, I'm having a problem with my vision and with this and that. And Shecky said, uh, you know what? He says, I have a doctor in uh, Beverly Hills. He's like the best eye guy. I'm going to send you to him. And Randy said, I can't afford it. And Shecky said, don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. I mean, and, and fortunately, Randy never had a go. His, his vision problem cleared up. But Shecky, on his own dime, was paying a guy he just barely knew to go to his specialist, you know. Wow, that's cool. Kind of guy he is. Yeah, he's, uh, he, you know, he did this and he did that, and, and he, he never made a big deal about it, so. Pete, I need to ask you, uh, yeah. since you live in Las Vegas and everything, what what do you feel is going to be the future for showrooms? I mean, I know what, what's happened since I was doing it on the road and up to now. I mean, now you don't find the rooms for entertainers to go and play and do their shows unless you're a big name working the big room do you think you'll ever see vegas come back to any anything yeah, close I, than I, what it used to be i don't think it's ever come back to there because there aren't uh i got peter lasalle on the tonight show when i called me 
and said, uh, you're coming in tomorrow to do the show. Bring the Vegas paper. We want to book some acts. And so I went up to Peter's office, and we sat there, and, and uh, he looked to the paper, and he looked up at me. He said, there aren't any stars here. And I said, I know what you mean. I mean, the biggest name was uh, the, it was the Canadian country singer, Ann Murray, was it, Ann? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she was the biggest star. There, weren't, there wasn't Sinatra. There wasn't Tony Bennett. Yeah. There wasn't Vic Damone. There wasn't Jack Benny. You know, there wasn't Danny Thomas. There, was, there wasn't, uh, <clears throat> you know, there wasn't a star of that magnitude in town at the time. And from there, it's gone down. So, I don't, you know, who knows where it's going to be. But I think someday, you know, they got rid of all the house bands. Right. The Hilton and the Tropicana colluded. They brought in a big union buster attorney from Dallas. And uh, they just about did away with the musicians' union. They let the bands go. If they get somebody who needs a band, they call it music a la carte. They hire a band for two weeks, give them their two-week notice opening night. Yeah, when I was when I was recently interviewing Bobby Rydell, he was talking about how they would bring these lab bands in to yeah. Vegas, and they would bounce them around and play, you know, one show at the Sahara, and then it would be over at the Frontier, and then they would run over to Caesars or whatever, and they'd they'd be bouncing all around, and and the guys were incredibly good. He said they never got stale; they were all excited to be playing and everything, and uh, and they were they were kicking rear, you know, really doing a good job. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the the whole complexion of of the of the whole Las Vegas scene is really really changed and so sad because it was well, uh, you know Rick they brought in management change you know once corporations got in yeah. because of Howard Hughes management change and they no longer in the in, when I first came out all the entertainment directors had a background in show business they were all either they owned clubs or they worked for uh, William Morris Agency, or they, or they were former entertainers. Or, you know, they all had some background, so they understood what an act was and what act would fit here and wh what, who would do well in this hotel. And, you know, they had some knowledge of it. And, and the band was very important. I mean, you know, you can't, uh, you can't just hire some guys you meet at the bus station to play Sinatra's book. You know, that's all Nelson Riddle and Don Costa uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, that's a different story. And same thing with the victim owner, Sammy Davis, you know, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. Their charts were, you know, and Nikki Perella wrote most of their stuff. Their charts were really, really complicated. They were magnificent, you know, the string parts and everything. But you can't, you can't just get some high school guys to play that book. Yeah. So, uh, so that... And that really hurt when they got rid of the bands, and then so they started to book, you know, people that are self-contained. Then they started to book country acts, and they drew people. So that's uh, that's where the taste is going, you know. Yeah, it's it's sad. I mean, I I remember so many times being able to. I when I started working eight to five, when we got off the road, and I moved back to El Paso, and and got a an eight to five gig. I it happened to be in electronics industry, and I. Always loved to go to the CES show, you know, yeah. which was the I think the second largest convention that Vegas would book every year, and, uh, yeah. and it was always so much fun because my son uh, was going to UT Austin at the time, and my daughter, and and but my son would he always loved to go to the CES show with me, you know. And well, I think he liked the good looking girls and getting the signed posters and all well, that stuff. Well, that too, yeah. yeah. Sure. But even uh, that's gone. Yeah, even that's gone. You know. <laughs> even that's gone. I but mean, but we love so know. much we could jump across the street and go see Celine Dion at the Forum, or we could go over and see, you know, Debbie Reynolds, or you know, uh, 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 so many things that used to be so much fun, and and not just the big names. You could go from lounge to lounge and see really good acts that were brilliant. incredibly brilliantly good, and uh, you know, so they're all gone now, and it's it's a it's a sad uh, sad world, but it's yeah. Uh, you, you know, Billy Billy Kay. You mentioned Billy Kay earlier. Billy Kay came to town with a group called the Kings Four, mm -hmm. and uh, they were a dynamite group, good musically and good comedy. He did most of the comedy. But the whole group, they did sketches together. They were really strong musically. And then uh, they broke up, and I don't know what happened to the other guys, but Billy went on to, you know, do his local thing. I tried to get him booked on The Tonight Show to do that trumpet thing with the glove on the front, you know. Right. He used to, he used to put a, 
a latex glove on the belt of the trumpet and play it. It would blow up and go back down. And, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think he was afraid. He, it's like he didn't want to. So Yeah. Well, it's... Yeah, what are we going to do, man? Well, I guess we'll just have to keep waiting for Pete to get back on to another talk show or something. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, when I hear people bemoaning it and saying, where's it going? And I say, you know what? Uh, it probably won't come back, but just be thankful that uh, our generation lived through a, a renaissance in music. We saw it go from, you know, the Glenn Miller big band. Yep. You know, to Woody Herman and Stan Kenton and Count Basie and Duke Ellington and Buddy Rich. And, and yeah. Buddy Rich's band, yeah, we saw that and we we saw the greatest you know, piano players in in the world, Oscar Peterson and uh, Bud Powell, you know, from the from the old days. We saw the greatest, you know, the trumpet players. I mean there's never gonna be another uh, Al Hurst. Never going to be another Doc. Benny Goodman, you know. Just... Yeah, Benny Goodman's band. Is, you know, we, we, we're never going to see that again. We're never going to see the same singers. We're never going to see Rosie Clinton. We're never going to see Ray Charles. I mean, all the singers that they think they're soul singers, they try to do what Ray Charles, Ray Charles did. They tried bending the notes, and do, but they don't have any idea what they're doing. They just think uh, maybe I'll do this, but they don't know that it's when Ray Charles did it. He only did it exactly where it was necessary right and you know ray charles did it nobody can do there's not there's not going to be another ray charles that's all yeah i know well pete i really appreciate you doing this episode with me today guy it has been so much fun going back memory lane with you you know it's yeah. 46 years a long time but uh yeah, i guess so yeah but uh but i'm i'm glad to to know uh, how to get hold of you now and and uh, uh, be able to visit again and have you tell some of your stories. Uh, it's been very intriguing. I really appreciate you taking the time out today to be on our show. Yeah, it was my pleasure, Rick. I mean that. Well, and when we got it, when we get back out to uh, Las Vegas, we'll definitely go get a bite to eat or something, you know. And let's do that. Let's do that. Would really love love to do that. I know uh, Sharon would like to do that too. But uh, Great. anyway, my friend, I'm going to let you go for now, and uh, we'll have this thing um, on the air in the next in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I, I put them out every Tuesday, and you can uh, listen to it on all of the. All of the podcast platforms that are out there or on TalkinRockRadio.com. People can dial in and uh, and uh, check it all out. And, but uh, thank you for doing this, buddy, and we'll, we'll talk again real soon, okay? Okay, my friend. Stay well. Thank you. You too. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. A really good way to hear all of our episodes. If you've never heard uh, some of our older ones, you can go to TalkinRockRadio.com and uh, see some of our videos that are on Zoom and our live calls. We've got some really exciting things coming up. We've got Bobby Goldsboro. We've got the El Paso Sojourners. We've got all kinds of fun things happening in the future. So thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.